News Today, brought to you by Admiral Corporation, in behalf of distributors and dealers all over America and in many foreign lands. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations and leading news centers of our own country, CBS reporters are waiting to bring you first-hand news from the world's political and battlefronts. Now, here's Douglas Edwards. The Americans have driven into Luxembourg at two points today, and allied gains are reported from other sectors of the western battlefront. More than a thousand American warplanes were out this morning, smashing a German transport behind the Siegfried Line. In the Mediterranean, the British Eighth Army is fighting a tough battle with the Germans on the Adriatic side of the Italian front. But the Americans have pushed into the outskirts of the Gothic Line. Marshal Tito's headquarters comes up with a rather contradictory bit of news that allied land forces are not operating in Yugoslavia, as reported earlier in the week. And now for a first-hand account of the fighting in Western Europe, Admiral takes you to CBS Paris, Charles Collingwood reporting. The Allied armies in Western Europe are fighting their way toward Germany through three countries, France, Belgium, and Luxembourg. We have really entered Luxembourg after days of premature reports, and Holland seems likely to be added to the list as our troops approach its boundary. All along the line, the Germans are putting up a stubborn resistance as they try to hold us off from Germany. But we continue to move forward closer and closer to the right. The closest point so far is the town of Tur in Belgium, 10 miles southeast of Liège and less than 20 miles from the German border. In the Ardennes Forest, we continue to make progress. In the Moselle Valley, we're fighting in Liverdun above Toul and trying to expand our hard-won bridgeheads across the Moselle. As a whole, the picture today is that the German army is trying to pull itself together for a defense of the fatherland and fighting savagely while our armies are getting into position and carefully preparing an attack against Germany and the Siegfried Line. In Paris, the political news is the reconstruction of General de Gaulle's government. The great political fact here is the resistance, which is not a party, but a state of mind. And most of the new men in the government represent the militant groups who fought for France from within. These are the men whom France looks to as her future leaders. And even if we aren't familiar with their names, the French are Fibro, Tahoji, Titian, Lacoste. And the French, who are an historically-minded people, have a respect for continuity and tradition. So in the new government, there is old Jules Genin, an elder statesman, president of the Senate, the common and he stands for the continuity of the French democratic tradition. The new French government will have its trials and difficulties, but it is soundly based on the spirit and experience of the French people. This is Charles Collingwood in Paris, returning you to Admiral in New York. We're sorry that the signal from Paris was not as clear as it might have been, but now for other developments in the West, Admiral takes you to London, Ned Calmer reporting. The temper of the war reports is turning cautious again. From every main sector of the Western Front, from the Albert Canal operations in Belgium down to the Lorraine Gap, correspondents are filing dispatches describing major German resistance. It looks as if we may be entering a period similar to the fighting in Normandy before the German retreat began. Or as one correspondent up at the front puts it today, the war has now changed completely in type since last week and the possibility of an autumn campaign cannot be ruled out. The prospect of a month or more of the toughest kind of fighting has not dimmed the revival of hope for an early peace among the British people. If you could have seen London today, you would have felt the rising tide of human relief and gratitude that at last, after five years, the struggle will soon be over. Only people who have lived that long amid total blackness at night and the terrible melancholy of the air raid sirens can realize how much it means to have the blackout partially lifted as it will be in a few days. Only people who have lived so long under the irksome duties of wardens and fire watchers and home guards can know what it means to be relieved of these duties soon. There are many signs of this relief. Mothers and their small children are coming back to London after months in places of safety believing that the German enemy, whom they call simply him, will never be able to launch his threatened rocket bomb in earnest. The theaters are beginning to fill up again, and a theatrical season that will include Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontan is beginning to boom. But London is remembering the days of its trials. It's suggested that a medal be given to be known as the Order of the Weary Heart 
to all civilian veterans of these five years. It's also suggested that a special award be given to the people who have managed to eat certain kinds of meat during that period and to all those who at the worst moments of the Blitz had the courage to stay in bed. I return you now to Admiral in New York. You have heard from Ned Calmer in London and Charles Collingwood in Paris. More news in just a moment, but first here is Warren Sweeney with a message from Admiral Corporation. Admiral Corporation is the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonographs with automatic record changers. Consequently, when we tell you that the post-war Admiral record changer will be far superior to any offered before Pearl Harbor, you can believe it. May I ask a question, Mr. Announcer? I've got an automatic record changer that's given me a lot of pleasure in the years I've owned it. Uh, what's the Admiral got that's so different? Well, sir, to boil it down, the Admiral's superiority lies in its simplicity. Admiral has taken what was formerly a highly complicated mechanism and made it so simple in its operation that there's practically nothing to go wrong. Well, that's very interesting. But I'm rather proud of my collection of records. Will it protect them? Yes, there's far less chance for chipping or breaking your precious records in an Admiral. And the new Admiral Changer will greatly reduce the changing time records. Yes, sir, if you're looking for a radio phonograph with the best of everything, you'll certainly find it in Admiral. Now here once again is Douglas Edwards. Allied troops in southern France continue to make good progress. For a summary of the news in that area and on the Italian front, Admiral takes you now to CBS Rome. Winston Burdett reporting. The Germans in central France are putting up a stubborn fight on the approaches to Belfort Pass. They have considerable forces lined up on the north side of the Doubs River, covering their roads of withdrawal eastward toward the historic gateway to Germany. On the south side of the river, we have been closing in steadily toward the pass. American troops have pushed 24 miles up the valley from Besançon. Further east, French forces at one point are only 18 miles from Belfort, at the entrance to the gap where we will see the opening phase of the battle for Germany itself. Writing from Besançon today, CBS reporter Eric Severide describes our crossing of the old German occupation line which divided France until November 1942. It's immediately apparent, he says, that French life north of the line where the Germans had been for four years had been much harder than in the south. And Severide says, I quote, For one thing, the SFI, the French resistance forces, are not so well organized on the north side. The long German occupation meant that many more young men were shipped off to Germany. The Germans here have been executing Frenchmen for the slightest offenses, such as breaking the curfew. Food is a far more serious problem here. And when the French in Algiers talked about the great loss of weight among French people, they meant those here in the north, where it is actually true. End of quotation. The German army here in Italy is still fighting its own hard, separate battle. It's as though there were another war on this peninsula, unaffected by the collapse of German arms elsewhere. A few days ago, it was triumphantly announced in official bulletins here that the 8th Army had completely broken through the German defenses over by the Adriatic Sea. This was described as a decisive victory. It was expected that the 8th would smash right through to the plain and roll up the entire German line. It was not expected that the Germans would be able to improvise defenses on the few ridges ahead of us and there, behind the so-called Gothic line, stop our offensive dead. But that is what has happened. Once again, the battle in Italy has not gone according to plan. In the narrow gap by the Adriatic, the Germans have moved in many guns, many tanks, all of their frontline mobile reserves, the elements of seven divisions, including two panzer divisions. To the Fifth Army further west will fall the difficult task of trying to breach the German defenses by frontal attack over the mountains. Whatever is happening on other fronts, German resistance is not breaking here. They are still making us fight a battle for nearly every ridge and pay for every mile of our advance in Italy. This is Winston Burdett in Rome, returning you now to Admiral in New York. The Moscow Radio reported today that in August, 1,800 enemy aircraft were shot down on the Soviet-German front, the highest number during the summer offensive. The CBS shortwave listening station recorded the broadcast, which said that in the past few weeks, 
The war in the air has been focused in three areas. In the Baltic, Romania, and the Black Sea, and in the Warsaw sector. The Luftwaffe has concentrated big formations in the Baltics and the districts bordering East Prussia. Volker Wolf's 190 used as fighter bombers are being sent over in groups of 100 and 150. And now here in our New York studio to discuss with us military events in the Balkans and Russia is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. Certainly the most important Russian accomplishment of the past week has been knocking Bulgaria not only out of the war as a German ally, but back into the war again as a belligerent on the Allied side. Thus, the Balkan situation has now changed from one of complete German domination of the entire peninsula, except Turkey's little corner, to one in which Romania and Bulgaria are active allies of Russia, leaving to the Germans only their rather precarious hold on Yugoslavia and Greece. Naturally, these events have been of vast encouragement to the Patriot forces in both Yugoslavia and Greece. These forces are reported busily engaged in attacking German garrisons and particularly in cutting German lines of communication. The German hold on Greece, especially, is dependent on keeping open the belgrade salonika athens Railway, which has been cut in many places and which the Patriot forces now say they can keep permanently interrupted. Meanwhile, the Germans must find some means of replacing the Bulgarian troops formally in occupation as their allies of parts of Yugoslavia and of Greece. They must do more. They must find means of opposing those troops who are now their enemies and are closely backed up by the powerful Russian forces which are pouring into Bulgaria and apparently moving toward the vital railway which runs just west of the Bulgarian-Yugoslav frontier through the historic Vardar-Morava Valley. From Romania, the Russians have penetrated to the vicinity of the Iron Gates, where the Danube River breaks its way through the Carpathian Mountains. This puts the Russians virtually on the Yugoslav frontier in this area also, but there is as yet no official word that they have crossed that frontier. Also from Romania, Russian and Romanian troops are in possession of most of the important passes through the Transylvanian Alps and are reported descending the northern slopes of those mountains toward the Hungarian plain. This movement, if continued, would bring them to Budapest and northward toward the Moravian gateway between the Bohemian hills and the Carpathians, a direct threat to the invasion of Germany on the south. While the Germans' hold on the Balkans is thus cracking, and while her last ally, Hungary, is thus directly menaced, there are many indications that the storm of battle is about to break in full force against the German defenses in the east. Already the Germans admit that the Russians are beginning to extend their rather wide bridgehead over the upper Vistula, a bridgehead which menaces both Warsaw from the southwest and Krakow from the east. Already the Germans admit that the Russians are beginning to extend their rather wide bridgehead over the upper Vistula, a bridgehead which menaces both Warsaw from the southwest and Krakow from the east. There seems little question that the Russians are also preparing for an all-out assault against East Prussia, which is now about half encircled by Russian forces. Thus, as the Germans gird themselves to meet the full shock of Allied armies on the Meuse and the Moselle, they must also prepare to feel the weight of a coordinated Russian offensive from the Neiman down along the Vistula and even on the Danube. It is to be doubted whether the diminished resources of Hitler's Reich are equal to these responsibilities. Now, here again is Douglas Edwards. Today in Chicago, the Navy will make a unique award, the first award yet given to an entire industry. For the story behind the presentation, Admiral takes you to CBS Washington, Bill Slocum, Jr., reporting. Battles are won in many strange and unbelievable ways. Many a ship still sails and fights because some, in fact thousands, of patriotic women were willing to part junior with a neighbor and go off to the wars to the best of their ability. The United States Navy recognizes this as a fact, self-evident or not. So today at Wrigley Field in Chicago, some 50,000 radio and radar workers of the Midwest will sit in on a unique celebration, the awarding by the Navy of the first material certificate of achievement to an industry or a section of an industry. This unprecedented award will be given formally to the Radar Radio Institute of Chicago Incorporated, which consists of 65 various manufacturing groups which have banded together for the duration to share one another's personnel and production achievements. Rear Admiral Claude A. Jones, USN, Deputy Chief of the Office of Procurement and Material, thinks this is a well-deserved award, and he has accepted our invitation to talk about it today. Admiral Jones. The radio and radar people of Chicago 
have done a fine job. They have solved many problems which still plague other industries. When they needed more women workers, the Institute conducted a campaign that can be, well, a model for other industries. Admiral, I understand that a woman wasn't safe on the Chicago streets while that employment campaign was underway. Pretty near. The industry had agents all over town asking women if they'd like to work on this secret and delicate radio equipment. Shoppers were stopped leaving stores, and if the woman claimed she had to get her purchases home, why, the agent would say, Madam, we'll send your stuff home in a taxi. You just climb in this bus, and we'll have you working in a couple of hours. And they did, too. This secret radar equipment is obviously very difficult to discuss from coast to coast. Just how valuable in the war effort is this great secret weapon? First, radar is unquestionably the greatest scientific development of this war. Last year, the British were willing to accept the loss of 41 planes as well worth the eradication of the city of Pene Monday because there the Germans were engaged in research, development, and construction of radio location equipment. By attacking such an objective, future raids in Germany were deemed safer and the heavy loss in planes was deemed a small price for the damage inflicted on enemy defenses. What is your opinion of peacetime radar, Admiral? For security reasons, I can only say radar will have many uses. It is a very useful invention, and the Navy is proud of the part it had in helping to develop it. One other thing. Have you anything you'd like to say to the radio and radar workers in Chicago? Yes. First, well done, and keep it up. Second, we can use all your billing now and a little more. In fact, a lot more. Thank you, Rear Admiral Claude A. Jones, USN. I return you now to Admiral in New York. And now for a report from Spain already in progress. Admiral takes you to CBS San Sebastian. Glenn Stadler reporting. And even though they must know by now that the war is left... They apparently regard this as only a temporary setback, merely retarding the master race's ultimate domination of the world. These facts appear daily in the Nazi press, which reaches Spain on new concert planes arriving in Barcelona every two days. Chief exponent of redoubling the planning of peace for future wars is Das Schwarze Corps, official organ of Himmler's SS. The main German virtues it claims are the desire to dominate the world by force and the invincible information of educating German children to believe in the absolute right of militarism. To make certain that the youth is properly impregnated with this idea, Hitler has been sending out his most trusted fanatics to give cuts off. A major wolf, speaking to 16-year-olds on their way to the front, told them that the Nazi soldier was the best in the world and never was personally defeated even though enemy mechanical superiority might kill or capture them. The FF paper asserts it's much better to send boys out to die on the battlefield than abandon them in the streets with only the prospect of going up to be dishonest businessmen, which it says is the case in New York and London. Our prosecutor states that dishonesty is synonymous with democracy. Thus, Nazi phenomenon Fanaticism prefers death to absorption of thought not in tune with the Hitler Jugend song, Today We Own Germany, Tomorrow All the World. Our youth must carry on with the conviction, the Hamburg Ascendant Black says, that Germany must always be militant and aggressive. This is Ben Chapman and Tom Sebastian, returning with the Admiral in New York. Southwest Pacific Headquarters reports continued unopposed air attacks on Japanese positions from the Moluccas to the Philippines, and a new amphibious landing which completed allied conquest of the Scouten Islands off Dutch New Guinea. Heavy raids on Halmahera Island, southern guardian of the Philippines, and the Japanese shipping and aerial center on Dutch Celebes were included in the reported air attacks. Other targets included Palau, Seram, and Timor. Under air and naval color, cover, amphibious allied units landed Thursday on Sopiori Island, adjacent to American-held Biok in Galevink Bay. There's no Japanese opposition, and it was considered unlikely that more than a handful of enemy stragglers were on the island. 
Admiral Nimitz announces heavy blows by American Pacific Fleet cruisers and destroyers and carrier-based planes against the Palaus, the Japanese islands guarding the Philippines on the east. The big guns of the Navy were directed against the Palaus on Wednesday, and it was a follow-up attack to the blow delivered the day before by swarms of carrier fighter planes and 90-ton bomb assaults by Southwest Pacific land-based bombers. Carrier planes also took part in the Wednesday strike, while naval shells were wrecking or damaging buildings and defense installations and starting major fires on Anguar, the southernmost of the group. And now for the news on the home front... Admiral takes you to CBS Washington, Joe McCaffrey reporting. James Byrne's recommendation, blueprinting the nation's reconversion structure, is receiving a mixed reaction on Capitol Hill. The War Mobilization Director's suggestion that Congress appropriate up to $2 billion next year, if necessary, to keep farm prices from slumping heavily has won a favorable reception. Senator Russell declares Congress has made a solemn commitment to the farmers to maintain the price of basic commodities at 90% of parity for two years after the war. And, continues Russell, we've got to keep that promise no matter what it costs. The reaction was not so favorable, however, to the proposal for an unemployment compensation schedule of $20 a week for 26 weeks. Lawmakers say there is little chance that Congress, having rejected it once, would reconsider the unemployment plan. Opinions here indicate that Burns' recommendation for repeal of the excess profits tax after Japan is defeated will receive congressional support. Post-war repeal of the excess profits tax on corporations has been advocated a long time in Congress and is backed by some of the most influential men on the tax writing committees. In his broad program for meeting post-war problems, Burns suggested that when Germany is defeated, many of the present economic controls be lifted and that there be a return to the 40-hour week. Labor has endorsed this hour's cutback, but both the CIO and AFL is already on record in many quarters as believing that workers should have a higher base pay. They are beginning a campaign to obtain for workers the same pay for a 40-hour week that they have been receiving for 48 hours. I return you now to Admiral in New York. Southeast Asia Command Headquarters announced today that the 5th Indian Division has gained more ground on the Tidham Road. Fighting along the last eight miles to the Manipur River in contact with the main body of Japanese retreating in Burma from eastern India has been the main order of business. Hitting Japanese communications, RAF long-range fighters attacked a railway south of Maine in lower Burma and shipping in the Gulf of Martaban off Tenasserim. The British news agency Reuters reports from Stockholm today that Allied submarines operating in the Skagerrak, the 80-mile-wide strip of water separating northern Denmark and Norway, are said to be the main reason for the invasion fever which has gripped the Germans in Denmark. A neutral traveler who's just returned to Stockholm from Copenhagen, where he was in touch with members of the German command there, relayed the report. He added that the Germans believe that the Allies are concentrating invasion fleets in Britain and Iceland to seize Jutland, then Zeeland, the island on which Copenhagen is situated, and then land on the German Baltic coast. The role of the submarines would be to prevent those units of the German Navy now reported to be lying around the Swedish Baltic island of Bornholm off the southern tip of Sweden from attacking the invasion fleet. This report is supported by survivors of the German ship Westphalen, which was sunk on Friday. And now once again, here is Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral. When Hitler and Hirohito have cried quits, you probably anticipate owning a home freezer for the quick freezing and storing of foods. And we assure you, you'll be mightily impressed by the many exciting features of the Admiral Home Freezer. Your Admiral Home Freezer will simplify all your meal planning, for your Admiral will keep a large variety of foods on hand, permitting last-minute planning of menus. Your Admiral Home Freezer will make it easy to serve well-balanced meals, too. Meals can be prepared to meet all health requirements. Small quantities of necessary diet foods can be used without losing the rest of the package by spoilage. Yes, your entire plan of meal preparation will be made easier and more appealing when you own an Admiral Home Freezer, made by the same expert organization that has made Admiral Radio America's smart set. The war news on all fronts has been encouraging during the past few weeks, but we can't be lax in our war production. So long as the war is actually being fought up to the firing of the very last gun, our boys need the materials of victory. For the sake of millions of fighting Americans overseas, from now until complete victory, war production still must come first. 
World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's Smart Set, and post-war makers of Admiral Refrigerators, Admiral Home Freezers, Admiral Electric Ranges. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from leading news centers of the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBMIR Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago.